so the, the monies are not going to flow to local journalism. Um, but the Local Journalism Sustainability Act had so many smart things in it. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, if you're a member of Congress, how can you be against trying to make local journalism function in your community? Uh, because theoretically, they'd be helping cover you, <laughs> like cover cover the true. Uh, issues you're, you're working on that you care about. Um, yes. So the, for the life of me, I don't understand why you only have 50 or 60 members of Congress. It's bipartisan, too, because uh, a lot of yes. the places that have lost their papers the fastest are more rural red states, uh, you know, like like they they see this problem just as clearly. It's an equal um, opportunity. So I'd problem. love to. Yeah. yeah. So so this should be universal. Totally. And one of the reasons I want to have this conversation with you is try and push this because uh, I want people to pass the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. So so for the Me folks too. that are, are are wondering how the heck can you reverse this tide, like what is in the Local Journalism Sustainability Act that would help fill this one to $3 billion gap? Um, so uh, I, Steve is really clever. He was uh, worked at the, the FCC and he did this like important report documenting what was coming, everything that was coming. And actually he's the one who really helps us get to the one to $3 billion number because he's identified the critical information areas, costed out a way to a model of thinking about what are the key things that are missing. And he has also identified a lot of safe ways. Um, this is more recently now, safe ways to direct money to, to news without fear that the government is going to control the coverage. Yeah, which I have to say, that concern is so overblown because we all watch NPR. Uh, you know, it's like, do you really think that there's some government bureaucrat being like, you know, like, stop this Andrew Yang guy in his tracks? <laughs> like, <laughs> NPR. <laughs> um, you know, it's like, like the fact that people are so concerned that if government touches it, then all of a sudden we'll wind up in Big Brother zone. Um, it just strikes me as... Um, paranoid frankly it's like like you you have models in other countries you're the bbc that's freaking publicly funded uh you know it's been going on for decades and they yeah. managed to irritate politicians of every stripe yeah. uh so there there's no reason to think that especially if we're remote like yeah. if if the federal government sends money to tucson you're telling me that some bureaucrat's gonna be like hey folks in tucson <laughs> you know, <laughs> like we've got a school board candidate we have our eye on like that you know like that, that that's not um it's not anyway so i think that, that, i think me. that there the reason people are paranoid is that there is like there are propaganda efforts afloat that are working that are privately initiated and we do have um you know a president. Well, that's why we need to do this because you're exactly. seeing private propaganda fill the gap. Yes. Uh, you know, so so having a nonprofit or public funding model um, to me makes sense. And a lot of this stuff in um, in so I'm looking over here for some references because I want to get some of the facts right. Um, so the Local Journalism Sustainability Act has so many fun measures in it um, that I thought were genius. Like you said, very very clever. So number one, everyone gets a $250 refundable tax credit to pay for a subscription to a local news source. So essentially you, you sign up for local news, it's free for you. Uh, number two, any small business gets a $5,000 credit to buy local advertising. How fun is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's one of Steve's like, most genius ideas too, is that there's already a lot of government money that supports advertising. And so we can take, we can actually assemble a lot of money just by directing like public health messaging to the places that actually, by the way, happen to be the most trusted sources, local news. Because that's another thing. Like, yes. nobody trusts the media except their local media. Except <laughs> local media. We all instinctively trust local media more. Um, so to and your we point, should. number three. It's more trustworthy. <laughs> it is more trustworthy. It tends to be more objective and unifying, and that's why it's yeah. uh, it's depolarizing. Yeah. Number three, federal advertising budgets spent on local media organizations uh, and tax credits to maintain journalists and staffers. Number four, three to one uh, matching donation for any journalism nonprofit. So if you gave to your local uh, nonprofit paper or whatnot, you'd get uh, matching funds. Number five, define public service journalism as a tax deductible activity. The one I loved the most, number six, was an opportunity to reseed papers from private equity funds um, that have gotten gobbled up where you could try and replant it in the community. So here's I, what happened. Yes. 
You you have um, thousands of family-owned papers in cities around the country that got consolidated into a conglomerate at some point. Let's call it Gannett or uh, or, or one of these. Um, and then Gannett Alden fell on hard times yeah. and was then bought by uh, a private equity fund or a hedge fund. It's a private equity fund, typically. Um, and the private equity fund then owns a bunch of papers and then rings them for cash. They look around and say, ooh, like I have economies of scale. Um, and then if someone raised their hand is like, I'd like to report on my local school board and be like, well, that has zero economies of scale. So no, you're out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but now they're looking around for an exit. They're looking around saying, what the heck do I do with my investment? Because this has not worked out. Even my ringing for cash ruthlessness has not worked out. Yes. Uh, and so if you give them an easy way out and say, why not just give that paper back to the community with this 501c3, there are some local stakeholders, and we'll cash you out, not so you make out like a bandit, but that that you actually make it out alive. Yes. <laughs> um, that would be such an enormous win. I thought this was the most genius idea in the whole thing. Oh, well, thank you. I wrote it. No, I didn't. Um, but <laughs> I, I agree. I really agree. I think you're totally right. The, um, those are the group of us that were advising Steve and working with him on this are very concerned about what the risk is also for the exit that these um, private equity firms are going to pursue that own a significant number of the highly trusted brands in our country. And we know that there's a big risk of a bad outcome because we know, as you alluded to, that there are bad actors who are uh, on, on both, uh, I mean, bad actors, pr propagandist advocacy um, efforts that are starting new local news brands and allowing them to to spew partisan nonsense um, instead of fact-checked stories that actually bring people together. And so those actors, you know, exist out there. There is a fear that is, I don't think, unwarranted that the when the exit happens, it, the, the papers go into the wrong hands. And so I thought Steve's idea here, the replanting idea, is really a genius idea, too, um, because it says, let's incentivize a different outcome. With, well, with I'm going to use an example from the presidential the trail that maybe fo folks um, uh, will take to. Uh, the main paper that all the presidential candidates wanted to um, get coverage in was the Des Moines Register uh, because it's the biggest circulation in Iowa. And obviously, Iowa was the first state uh, and the rest of it. So yeah. we just hang out with them all the time Yeah. Um, or try to. Yeah. Um, and so if they wrote a good story about you, you were very, very pleased and uh, like your staff was very happy. Uh, Des Moines Register was bought by one of these uh, private equity firms uh, and like tacked on to its, you know, several hundred newspaper collection <laughs> uh, while I was running. And so yeah. the journalist I was talking to was there was like, well, we're not sure what's going to happen now. We just got new ownership. And like, it wasn't like a hip, hip, hooray. We got new ownership. It was like, uh oh, like, you know, I might lose my job kind of situation. Um, so so these are the folks that we've been relying upon. Yeah. Um, for generations to help vet uh, national candidates who, yeah. who come through. Uh, and so if you start doing a number on even massive pillars of local journalism, like the Des Moines Register, like where, where, do you, where does it end? It, it ends in tears, uh, really. Or it ends in an information wasteland. And like you said, propagandists will fill that. And I'm really worried right now. And I actually started a third um, organization um, the last month because, uh, okay, think back to um, 2000, the last time we had a contested presidential election, which it looks possible that we're going to have again. Um, and it came down to Florida. Um, the the apparatus at that time of the, of the newspapers in Florida was so strong and robust. Like, um, and the Miami Herald, I think, had about 350 person newsroom at the time. And they just went to town making sure that, um, you know, people understood what a hanging Chad was and they were in the room watching the Chads hang or whatever was actually going on. And and that's that's like really um, you can't underestimate the difference between what the the rest of us were who were just kind of sitting at home watching CNN here or or whatever we're watching now, um, Twitch here uh, when we're having it explained to us what, what is going on, if the people who are in the national stage have that behind them, have like all that 350 person newsroom that like understands the, the arcane details of 
local politics and local election administration versus today, the Miami Herald newsroom is under 100 people. It's probably about 50 people. I mean, that's that's just like unreal to think about what's going to happen. And it's like we are in a much more insecure and unstable um, situation in terms of uh, challenges to the integrity of the election because one of the two candidates for, for president has already decided he doesn't trust the outcome. Plus, a pandemic has made a lot of Americans wonder if they can trust the outcome. Adding on to that, like the a history of voter suppression and that, that has been kind of opened up a little bit with by certain court moves. And, the, and so all of that um, is really scary situation, like even right now, because the people that are going to be explaining all of this to us have even less firsthand independent accounts to rely on, which is why. But like you said, they'll all be parachuting and then, uh, you know, you get there and like, who's there? Uh, and we, what's the record? And we already saw that happen in the primaries. People, the, the you know, you, you, it, it, I love journalists. I am a journalist and I want to say you can always believe journalists, but you actually can't always believe journalists because sometimes they do parachute and we do do that and we don't know what we're talking about. And it's dangerous to say, to scare people about things that you don't actually need to be scared about, but it's also um, dangerous to to uh, relieve, make people feel relief when they shouldn't. I mean, it's just a bad, bad situation. So, um, so the, I was like I, I, up, yeah. I, th I think journalists have been getting a bad rap, um, but I think a lot of the bad rap they've been getting does not apply to local journalists, to your earlier point. It's like we, we just sort of trust local journalists in a different way than we do um, some of the national media figures. And the national media figures, a lot of the economic incentives are around feeding into the polarization narratives, unfortunately, and, and those incentives do not tend to exist locally. Like if you're a small town paper, the last thing you're going to do is being like, we're the small town paper that only half of you are going to like. It's not yes. really a recipe for success. I mean, like, obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but the truth is that, yeah, I, I agree with you. And that's so so I started a project, Andrew, called Vote Beat, where we are deploying local reporters because in the pandemic we've seen just hundreds and hundreds of reporters furloughed from their jobs who have um, who are local reporters who have this deep trusted relationships in their communities. They have a lot of local knowledge, but they're not working. And then there's um, this craziness that we have to cover. So yeah, you're matching the resources to the need. Nicely done. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and it's one reason why we have to act fast, Elizabeth, because these reporters expertise will not be there forever. Uh, you right. know, the ability to replant these papers will not last forever. Yes. Um, yes. We, we have a window of time that we have to run through, um, a window of opportunity. Uh, and I, I applaud you for leading on this issue, uh, certainly before I'd figured it out. Um, we need to try and get more resources to the American Journalism Project. We need to pass the Local Journalism Sustainability Act. If we do that, then we'd have a real chance um, at having people like you covering important issues in communities for decades and generations instead of seeing it wither away. Thank you for listening in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please do subscribe to Yang Speaks and click on notifications so we can let you know every time we have a new episode.